Hej Daniel Nilsson. Hej, hej. And uh, much welcome to uh, this guest lecture in the, the IoT course at Linnaeus University. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and uh, you, you have been invited here because you work at a battery company. Yes. And not far from Kalmar. No, correct. No. <laughs> So this is this is actually really cool that we have these uh, very advanced battery manufacturing companies very close by in the region. So in the in the southeast part of Sweden. Uh, so it's uh, and actually this is a new acquaintance. We haven't really been in touch before. So this is sort of um, the first time we meet together in 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 this setting. So yeah. Um, you're going to talk a little bit about batteries today. Yes, correct. Yeah. Uh, I will talk a little bit about batteries, uh, how they work and what to think about when uh, when designing an IoT system and, and sort of what easy mistakes you can avoid uh, in terms of batteries. Typically, the batteries is, of course, a, a key hardware to, to your system. So, so it's, it's important to think about this. So. Yeah. So you have a screen to share and I can share it. And then also don't yeah. forget to introduce yourself, Daniel. Yes, I, uh, yeah. I, I think I will start by introducing myself. Uh, yeah. So my name is, is Daniel Nilsson and uh, it is correct. I, I work for a battery manufacturing company called Saft. So it's a, it's a French owned company, uh, but there is, a, uh, there is actually a factory in the south of Sweden. Oskarshamn, where we have a production volume of, if we if we say it like they do in the lithium world and, and talk about the gigawatt hours, uh, we, we are actually a giga factory. We are a little bit over one one giga factory. Um, we already have a giga factory close by that. <laughs> yes, we, we do. But typically, however, we, we produce uh, industrial batteries so we, we are not sort of in the EV sector from from our factory at least and that that sort of means we, we get a little bit less coverage maybe in the news at least these days uh, but uh, but what I'm going to talk about today is, is is not so much the big industrial batteries that I work with uh, primarily but but I will speak a little bit about the typical batteries that you will most likely choose for your IoT applications which is the primary lithium batteries yeah, and uh, then you can also mentioned that like what you see in the background here that the soft if a lot of these IoT devices that you buy on the shelf if you even if you order things from China and you find a soft battery inside <laughs> at least I have so yeah uh, which, yeah which is I would say in terms uh, of the IoT market uh, and the battery supply their soft is is a very big supplier uh, so it's uh, and and even here I mean we. We might not think about it. We, we think maybe everything is, is a shiny supplier today, but, but actually this is, as I said, it's a French-owned company. We've got a lot of factories, both in, uh, we have one in Sweden and we have several in, in the rest of Europe as well. So, so both from that perspective as well, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a company and it's a company that has quite an old history in batteries as well. The Swedish factory where I worked was, was established uh, over 100 years ago uh, with with the very sort of early batteries and the early battery designs so so of course it has there is some some uh, some knowledge in the house as well and then now we are seeing a very big push towards batteries which we are of course very excited about mm. uh, good and and my own uh, my own background and my own role i i, I got a, a background as, as an engineer and uh, my role at SAFT here is as, as head of our development, so I, I lead our development on the industrial side and for our industrial batteries. Good, so what I will be presenting today, it's, it's a bit of an overview about sort of how a battery works, what to think about when, when, this, uh, when choosing a battery and sort of what differences there might be in terms of different batteries. It's, I, I think it's a, it's a very common uh, maybe problem today that that's uh, that you might have when you are designing sort of your first IoT devices is that you you think maybe a lot on the type of sensor you have you think a lot on the processor that you choose but what you are not thinking so much is about what battery you are choosing uh, 
I mean, you, you have a big risk of going into DigiKey or Alpha or, or whichever supplier you're using and just picking the first battery that, that yeah. you find. But obviously, uh, there are not only different sizes in terms of capacity for the batteries, but there are also different types of chemistries, different types of designs that will sort of be more or less suited for, for your needs. And, uh, and definitely thinking about this before can, can make you avoid a lot of headache. Uh, and when we are talking about IoT devices today, I would say most of them are primary lithium cells, uh, meaning they are not rechargeable. Uh, that, that basically, uh, I think, the, at least from a battery perspective, our understanding about this is that this sort of comes from the fact that many IoT devices tend to be quite uh, inexpensive. So you don't want to sort of, there's no need to, to recharge the battery. Or it, it would sort of be too messy. It, yeah. it, it's supposed to last maybe 10 years and then you, you're, you're supposed to basically throw it away. Yeah. So we are seeing a lot of primary lithium on the, on the IoT side. Yeah, and that I think from from when you're developing something in like especially when you're playing around with with hardware and stuff, then you might end up with choosing a recharger the battery. But for the end products, you say that that is not the the common thing to do. For, for the end product, we mainly see primary yeah. as as the the one. Uh, but yes, you you're correct. During the development, you might want to have the rechargeability for sure. But that sort of makes it more all the more important that, that you really think about the battery you're choosing when you're doing the final implementation, which would be the primary. Uh, one thing or one area of sensors we are seeing where you are not choosing a primary is, is typically the, uh, the type of sensors that have some sort of solar recharging or some, some maybe small solar cell. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you, you want to be able to, to maybe recharge the battery to extend the lifetime uh, a bit further. But, but still today, I would say, if you're not having a very power hungry sensor, if you're not sending too often, you will actually get quite a lot of years from the primary lithium cells. So, so it's still quite, quite a preferable option for, for a lot of, of different applications. Uh, good, so uh, I think I, I will start to, to go through a little bit about what we'll talk about today. I, I will tend to um, skip a few of the slides or maybe not focus so much on, on this. Uh, in fact, uh, this type of training comes from a, a several day training that mm -hmm. we tend to have with, with, uh, with people. So of course we will be a bit limited in time here, but I, I think we should still be able to cover the, the basics and the, to, to at least get get a clear sort of message across on, on what to consider. And then, and then for sure, if, if you're more interested in that, there are, are more information to, to, to be gained. Uh, in terms of a battery, uh, what the, the message that I think is, is important to start with is that a battery, it's, a, it's not a new thing and it's not such a complicated thing. Then uh, of course, as a, as a manufacturer of a battery, uh, it, it sort of becomes very complicated indeed, but typically what we do is we put some chemical elements in, in, a, in some container and, and that's how we create our battery. And uh, it's, uh, it's sort of the fundamentals of a battery is that we have our, our, our chemistry and our, our chemical active material that, that we put in a container and then and, and we get our, our battery. Uh, the principle of a battery no matter, uh, I mean, you will hear me today talk a little bit about the different battery chemistries. Uh, the principle of, of any type of battery will, will sort of always be the same in, in terms that you will have, you will have a, a negative active material or a, an anode that, that will be your electron giver. You will sort of put this on the other side from a positive active material or your cathode, which can take the electrons. Somehow you will need to separate uh, these materials so you don't short circuit the, the, the materials. And then you will have it in a sort of ion conductive uh, electrolyte. Uh, no matter sort of what battery you are seeing, if it's a primary, secondary, if it's a lithium or, or lead or, or nickel, 
the sort of principle will, will remain the same. And, and even if, if you're speaking about a, a sort of very popular, uh, uh, a very popular area within the battery research industry today, it's the solid state uh, lithium cells. Uh, still, I mean, the principle is the same. Uh, only difference is that here we are looking for an ion conductive electrolyte that is in a solid state. Uh, but but the sort of principle is 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 always the, the same for for your batteries like this. Of course, you can start to play around and sort of challenge this type of uh, of design. But but in sort of in the end, this is uh, how your sort of battery will will be structured. Uh, and then, of course, you put it inside some container and you will have your positive and negative uh, fall of the cell. Uh, as I said, and, I, and what I think is, is, is quite clear is that we can do this type of design in a lot of different ways. If we are talking about the cylindrical cells you might be very familiar with, uh, prismatic cells or are surely growing in some areas right now. Uh, button cells are also something that you might have seen in your um, watch or, or similar sort of smaller applications. Pouch cells are becoming also quite popular in some uh, electrical vehicles right now. Uh, and then we also have the opportunity or the possibility of putting together several of these single cells into a what we call a pack or a block where we will simply connect several of these cells together. And here we can choose to, to do it serially or, or parallel, depending on sort of if we are looking for, for voltages or capacity. And uh, so also... in, in, in general, what, what the shape here is, is obviously there are, some, there are a lot of design uh, um, uh, choices for like what, what shape it ends up with. But generally, what, what would you say like, in IoT, are we looking at the coin cell and the cylindrical shape in, in more or? Yeah, I would say definitely if, if, if we're looking at IoT, uh, I'm guessing primarily you will be working with the cylindrical cells. Yeah. Uh, what is an option and that this will depend on your uh, the type of application or the need you had, you, you might uh, want to have it structured in some type of battery pack because typically a single a single cell might be a bit low uh, low voltage, depending on how you structured your application. We know there are some popular designs today that, that are uh, five voltage, uh, uh, five, five volt uh, designs. So then it, it might be that you, that you want to connect at least two cells together. But uh, cost wise, is it any like difference between like the design is cylindrical cell generally cheaper or more extensive than a oh it's a very hard uh, question, right? that's a controversial <laughs> topic you're raising yeah now. okay <laughs> uh, I, I think it, it will surely depend on whoever is your supplier yeah uh, but but here I mean think and see what what can be offered if, if a supplier tends the suppliers tends to go for from different they tend to focus on one or two of, of these designs and, and then they tend to be very efficient in those. So they might be able to reach very competitive costs, yeah. uh, but, but for sure it, it can be a bit different. Uh, but, but overall, I think it's more and more suppliers are sort of becoming more and more efficient on their own processes. So, so I'm not sure if there is an inherent one that, that at least mm. can be stated for certain. Uh, and, um, but, but something that, that can be a cost driver, it is if you, if you need to have your battery somehow protected, I think that the casing that we can see to the right here is, is one that is, is typically used in, in airplanes or in military applications where the cost of the very rough environments, they require an extra casing. And then of course, uh, it, it will be a cost driver because you will have to encase your, your cells very extremely. Uh, for some type of, um, of use cases, uh, it might also be that you want to put your batteries inside uh, maybe more of a, a temperature or heated environment, uh, which, which could also be a cost driver. Uh, but it, it will depend, I, I guess, if you're, if you're looking for an IoT application in very cold places, definitely consider how the temperature will impact the operation of the battery and if there 
it would be more cost efficient to sort of try to compensate for mm. for the, the cold temperatures. But I, I will come a little bit more to just how what to think about temperatures, because it's uh, it's quite an important it's a port- it's an important consideration to make, and, and one that should sort of not be underestimated. Yeah. Uh, good. So I think I will I'll move on. Uh, Electrochemistry. If 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 I'm looking at my own sort of team of development developers, we we are very chemistry heavy, of, of course, because in the end, most of the improvements that you can do, most of the sort of fundamentals of what we are producing, is actually based on the electrochemistry of of what we are making. And if 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 we look on it, I mean. We will always have the, the the sort of some fundamental parameters that we measure. We talk about the voltage, the current. Uh, you you heard uh, maybe in the beginning I was a bit skeptical to the gigawatt uh, hours that that we are discussing, and it's yeah. of course the, the power, and the, and you will sort of understand why maybe I'm a bit skeptical to this because we, since the, the 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 voltage and the the power. Is then the combination of the the current and the and the voltage. So, because we are having different nominal voltages for different chemistries, it sort of becomes becomes difficult to compare two two different chemistries when we are talking in watts. And then it might be more reasonable to talk, for instance, in ampere hours. Uh, mm. But but I, I think it will be a bit clearer further on also why this distinction is important to make. Uh, but in the end, uh, and and what I, I sort of try to make clear also with the image, the design of the battery is well in terms that we need to have an electron taker and an electron giver, and somehow combine these to, to get the potential and to be able to actually uh, store and, and release energy as, as we want. Uh, and to our help, we have our, our very... Uh, very reliable periodic table and you will find uh, in this table of course the materials that are very commonly used uh, if we're looking for instance at lithium you can see we have lithium here as a very strong reducing agent if you're looking at the oxidizer agents you can see chloride we have here which is also very uh, popular and commonly chosen today in the middle here we will also find some uh, some um, uh, some elements that, of course, are, are quite important for us as well. We have the nickel here, which we also know is, is, a, is, a, is a very important material and one that, uh, that of course, uh, due to recent world events, we have seen a lot of price changes in, uh, but of course, one that, that also is being driven now, uh, where we have a very high demand from, from for especially nickel, uh, lithium, cobalt, etc. So, uh, in the end, it's uh, if if you're a chemist, you know you're you're looking at this periodic table like your uh, like your dinner table, and then you're yeah. trying to just choose from this sort of smorgasbord of uh, of elements to to get a very beneficial combination that that you can combine into your battery. Um, because this combination of elements will be what, what is actually driving your nominal voltage. And this comes from what we call the redox scale. And then you might have seen it in your sort of fundamental chemistry lessons that if we start comparing how uh, willing an element is to give or receive electrons, we can actually start to grade them. And the differences between them is the nominal voltage that, that we will get. So here, if we compare zinc and magnesium dioxide, you will see that, in fact, we get a sort of nominal voltage of 1.5. Mm-hmm. But if we, instead of zinc, use lithium, we, we can sort of double this, go to three volts. So it, it all sort of becomes a very fundamental property, this, uh, this voltage level, depending on which material we have chosen. Uh, you can see lithium chloride, we, we go even higher. Uh, and of course, being able to, to increase the vol- nominal voltage per cell can be very beneficial in terms of, of the applications where you do require a, a high voltage. And if we uh, instead sort of, if we say have a zinc uh, magnesium dioxide and, and want to gain, get three volts, we have to, to sort of collect them in series to, to actually get the three volts. 
good and then we have and and this basically becomes the reason why we cannot simply choose uh choose anything <laughs> because if we uh, when when we start combining our elements we of course need them to be able to have a discharge profile and they need to be able to retain and release electrons as we want them to and you can see that what we have shown here is is the uh, discharge curve to uh, to fully discharge batteries and how the voltage will change and you can see that the shape of the curve it is not simply being shifted in, in voltage level, but it's actually completely changing how it behaves. I mean, if we have uh, one cell here, you can you can see that it actually drops very quickly. I think if I have, you can see here we are we are getting a from basically fifty percent state of charge down to the last zero. We we are having a very linear decrease, whilst on a completely different um, chemistry, it's uh, the curve is. is uh, basically flat and this of course becomes very important for you to consider during the design of your IoT application because if you have a DC-DC with a cutoff voltage uh, say at uh, 2.6 of course if you're having uh, if you're having a chemistry in your battery that is something like this you will only be able to get 70 percent of the capacity in the cell and then your DC-DC will be cutting off yeah. Whilst if you're using another chemistry, you might be able to utilize much more of your um, uh, inherent capacity. So uh, this is something that is, is quite important to consider. It's also important to consider if you uh, are not sort of relying upon a very stable DC-DC or you're thinking that you want to rely upon only the battery voltage, that you might have a battery voltage that might change or not change during the discharge. So. It's uh, the chemistry is definitely a very sort of fundamental property that you need to uh, to understand and to consider during your design. Uh, then we have the design assembly. I, I will not speak so much about this. I think it's not uh, not something that is uh, sort of very interesting to to cover. Basically, what what is being done is that we put the elements in, if we are talking cylindrical now, we put the elements inside the, the cylinder and, and close it. Uh, so I think so that, that was the easy part, as you said, that it's not hard to make a battery. You just put things in, in to together. <laughs> then it's, uh, yes, then it's the simple part. No, but yeah. for sure, uh, it, it can go some, some thought into this as well. So maybe I, I shouldn't have mm. said this, but uh, <laughs> uh, the only thing, like I said before, that you might want to consider for your own applications here is, do you need any type of extra protection, extra sort of insulation against uh, temperatures or uh, something else? Uh, that, that is sort of the, what I would consider. And here is, is something that might be relevant for you, for you as well. It's uh, if you want uh, more, uh, more than one cell and you want to create the battery packs, uh, then this is something either that, that you would do yourself or, or something that, that of course can be, be provided by, by the manufacturer is that, that you would sort of create the final, uh, the, the final pack. And here you can see a, a one that has been a very big one. So it's, it's uh, I don't remember which type of application this was from, but, but definitely not for, for an IoT sensor. I can, no. can guarantee that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but at least, um, again, quite important to consider here. Do you need this? Do you not need this? Um, now, and, and here I will speak a little bit about the chemistry. I think it's, uh, as I said, you should not underestimate the fact that when we are talking about lithium cells, uh, we are not simply talking about one type of, of batteries. And, they will have quite fundamental properties that, that should be very important to know. And one thing, and one thing that, that we see in this graph here is that the type of current you are expecting to, to withdraw from the cell might also impact the choice you're making in, in your technologies. Uh, if we are talking that, uh, for instance, you have a Let's say you have a very power hungry sensor, you are temporarily drawing very high power. 
then you need to make sure that you're not choosing a, a chemistry that, can, that is very poorly, that is very poor at handling these types of, uh, of power outputs. Uh, there, there is also uh, typically from a manufacturer point of view, you might divide your range so that you have, uh, even if it's the same chemistry, you might, uh, we, we might change a little bit in how we, we design and how we structure the, the cells meaning that we can adapt, even the same chemistry, we can adapt to a higher or a lower current. Uh, so, um, if, I mean, the, the, the normal, if we're talking about a sort of normal IoT application, what you will be considering most of the time is that the, the highest sort of, um, the highest uh, power consuming component of your design will typically be your communication circuit. Uh, but but it, it is fully possible that you are having some type of sensor or some type of of different component that for some reason draws a lot of power and in that case definitely consider um, consider the um, the type of, of chemistry you are using. Yeah, uh, but the different chemistry you you might come to this later on. But like self discharge mm -hmm. uh, for yes. different uh, kinds of of chemistries. Yeah, yeah, I, I will. Uh, I will not speak so much uh, on this, but it will definitely come, and and that's also important to consider. I would say, if you're having very low, uh, if you're withdrawing very low uh, amps, or you're having a very low power outtake from the cell, then the, it's important to consider the the self discharge because it will actually sort of increase your aging. If if you are having sort of medium or high power outtake you you will never see the self discharge as part of your aging but for sure if it's very low it's, it's important um yes uh, and uh, i can actually, i actually had the um, the opportunity to work on a project that was i think implementing some type of if it's a very small radar system but it, it was still a radar but was quite small and I, they wanted to have a a battery on this and of course, the radar was, even though it was quite small, it was still quite power consuming. And you could, uh, you could see that the first uh, type of cells that they tested was, was actually not very well suited for, basically the radar had a power peak that was quite high. And uh, the chemistry was not very well suited for these types of peak because as soon as the power peak came, the voltage in the, the cell dropped quite substantially. When the voltage dropped, it's the system sort of cut off. So yeah. they never managed to get a good reading until then they switched chemistry in their cell. Uh, and this, of course, took some time until they understood exactly what is happening. Because if we're looking at, and then I will show some graphs on this later on, but some of the uh, sort of drops in voltages that you might get after a, a peak in, in the power might be happening very quickly. So, I mean, if, if, if you are simply not sitting having everything connected to uh, to all your your measurement instruments you, you might not be able to detect this and it might take quite some time until you understand what is happening uh, but but here and then this of course is is something when uh, i mean if from from a soft perspective and i'm sure the other manufacturers do this as well is, is that they try to sort of help and guide also the the, the people buying the batteries to make sure that that um, it's actually sort of clear what, what sort of product and what uh, benefits they are getting. Uh, good, and uh, let's see, I will do like this, I'll do like this. And uh, let's see here, just as I said, I, I sort of want to talk a little bit sort of on the main, uh, main chemistries at least that are being used, because uh, I think it's, uh, of course, it's, it's no point in, in going through everything in detail, but at least it's, it's important to see that there are some sort of severe differences that we might have. Uh, here we are speaking about the li a lithium thi thionyl chloride battery, uh, and it will sort of look something like this, where uh, we are having a cell, I think, uh, yes, this slide I think is, is actually better. Uh, what you will see here is that if we are doing a discharge, you can see that the voltage is quite stable, a small drop in the beginning, but then it's quite stable until it falls when the battery is basically discharged. 
typically what, what we have in and how if we could open this cell and look on it during a discharge, what we will see is that in the beginning, we will have a very sort of a big part lithium, we will have some carbon, um, it will be surrounded by electrolytes. When we are sort of doing our discharge, we will start to consume uh, the, the electrolyte and we will start to, to also consume the lithium and we will get a carbon structure that will be expanding. And this is a process that will happen throughout the usage of the battery. Uh, the good thing with, with this sort of uh, chemistry, if you're looking at it from a stable perspective, is that you will not see much on the voltage, not until you reach the very end, when basically what, what has happened is that we have consumed basically all the lithium. We will only have trace amount of electrolyte left, and we will have uh, a, a sort of fully expanded carbon structure within the cell. What does happen, however, and, and it was very quick, you can see we are speaking milliseconds here, but when you're first starting to use the cell, you're getting a very quick dip in the voltage that later recover. And you can see, if we go back to the previous slide, you see it's, it's not so easy to, to even see this drop, uh, but it, it is there, sort of goes down in the first milliseconds of the charge and then sort of comes back. And this also has to do with the, the sort of fundamental structures of how the chemistry is divided. Because if we go here, let's see. Yes, what is happening is that when we are first starting to use the cell, we're getting what we call the ruptures. We're actually breaking apart part of the chemistry. Because we are breaking apart the chemistry, we are seeing the voltage drop because suddenly we get loss of contact. The good thing though is that we can see that, that we have this recovery later on and it, it's part of the, yes, the rebuild and the protection. Okay. So that is why we are seeing, we are seeing an initial drop that sort of very quickly recovers. Uh, but I would say this is typically if you're having a normal sort of DC DC design today, you would on both sides of your DC DC today typically have some capacitors that will be able to compensate for this drop. Uh, but again, it sort of shows the importance also don't sort of, if, if you're missing steps in your hardware designs, if you're not having the correct capacitors, if you're not thinking through on, on how to handle these things, you might have a DC DC that, that would sort of be on or off uh, quite quickly there, which might cause you to have boot up problems like your microprocessor or something like that. Yeah, but they, these kind of things that it, well, how do you like you, you need to measure them? You need to have kind of, some kind of measurement tool to do the proper pro power profiling in beforehand, or or do you just try out different batteries and what's what's the approach to to actually attack I, these kinds of of problems? I would not say it's it's something that um, that at least it, you, you should be aware of, and this is, I think, comes back to the importance of choosing a battery that is right for your application. If you have designed your hardware to, to have the, the correct capacitors in GCC, you will never see this type of behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this sort of shows just the importance of thinking here. When it comes to, and, uh, and I mean, if we are talking to, uh, to, to other manufacturers or, or, or the battery experts typically, they will also be able to help. And I will show a digital tool that we have available also, where you can sort of describe how your system works and it will sort of recommend a chemistry on, on what we sort of think might be very suitable. And then of course, if it can be, if we're talking volume sales as well, it tends to be so that, that we have, um, that we have actually sales people working on, on providing sort of expert advice. Yeah, uh, and I, I have gotten a couple of questions here, but maybe you will, maybe you have slides that will cover these questions later on. But I'll I'll just bring them up so we yeah, don't forget yeah, them. But that's... one one question about like um, about safety of batteries that uh, <laughs> it, it, I mean batteries exploding or getting on like the fire hazard and such is this like a mainly a, like a problem with bad quality of battery manufacturers like or is yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I would say uh, uh, I would say that the, the sort of the 
the reason we have seen when when there is this type of uh, of an explosion of fire is, is typically you have an issue with a separator that that you you remember we had the separator trying to keep the materials apart yeah when it fails uh, that that's when you tend to have a short circuit that that would very quickly sort of develop a, a very lot of energy that that that, that would be a that, that would be an issue so if you're having a manufacturer that that, that produces uh, have a good quality on their production. Have a um, uh, have a, a sort of a very good quality check, especially on the separator. Shouldn't be happening. It's also uh, based on what I've seen, at least. It's it's primarily also when we are talking about the secondary cells, the rechargeable lithiums, because then of course you are stressing the materials. You are stressing uh, your design more and more. Uh, so that that tends to be a bigger issue compared to uh, the primary cells where where you are you're bound to sort of have one discharge and that's it. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I got another question, but maybe that is more, that that is obviously for secondary cells. Like if you want to create your own battery pack out of 18650 cells. Mm. Uh, mm. So can you recommend a good spot welder? That's the question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the... Uh, no, no, I, <laughs> not, uh, not that I would feel comfortable with. Uh, no. Recommending like this, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, no, no, I think just try to find something that works. Uh, what is important to consider when doing your uh, your pack and uh, and especially when integrating any type of battery in your hardware design is you, you need to consider that you're having a very good contact area with the battery terminals. Because if you're having a resistance created by uh, poorly connected battery cells, you're of course having a lot of loss that, that you don't want. So just make sure you have a, a good connection point to your battery terminals. Good. Uh, so I think uh, I will move on and just show the difference here between the manganized dioxide. Uh, because here you can see the design is a bit different. We're not working so much before where we are consuming the, uh, the carbon in the cell or consuming the lithium in the same way, or now we are not having the expanding common structure, but we're having a, a quite a different uh, structure that you can see like this, where we're spreading out the lithium. But you can also see that we got a completely different discharge curve, which will, of course, impact uh, what we are seeing. So in the beginning, you will very quickly be dropping your voltages. In the middle, it will be quite stable. But then again, you will have this sort of uh, the gradual decrease later on. Uh, and, and what you can see is we are consuming the lithium. Uh, and we are getting the final transformation. So I think I, I will not go into more detail here. Uh, rather that, just bear in mind that the discharge profiles will be a bit different. Yeah. Uh, again, here, primary cells, not rechargeable. Uh, I, mean, I mean, you have shown this uh, discharge curve here uh, and, and a couple mm -hmm. of different chemistries. So yeah. Could we say generally, like, is it depending on, on each case or like if you're a yeah, beginner into this area? So like what, uh, what, what kind of battery? Maybe you're going to show that later on. I will, uh, I will show you. I think let's, yeah. let me go ahead. Because this is what you need to consider. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of everything from which type of currents will you have, which discharge rates will you have, which temperatures do you have, which cutoff voltages do you have, which... Uh, self-discharge are you expecting uh, because in the end I mean what, what it comes down to is that you want something that fits everything if, if you uh, you might have one chemistry that okay it has a discharge profile that you are not happy with but it's very suitable for the temperature that, that you are experiencing and in that case of course you have to sort of mix and try to, to take the one that fits your own need um, so just the background current and, and the sort of general consumption of uh, anything from, I mean, you, 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 if you're having your capacitors, you will have a leak current from your capacitors. Your integrated circuits, they will have some consumption even in sleep mode. Uh, for sure, you, you will have some periodic wake up or some measurements, otherwise your, your IoT system is not doing anything. So this is, I think, the fundamental parameter and the one that you are most likely the most familiar with. But in order to do this, you need to consider also the, the discharge rate. If we are having, compared to how we rate the capacity, a very low uh, discharge rate, 
you will see that the actual capacity that we can use, it's not so high. It's not at least, it's, it's not as high as when we are somewhere here. And the reason is that in this end, uh, in this end here, the self discharge will be limiting us. So we are actually losing some potential capacity here because we are withdrawing current very slowly. So, so we actually get an impact from self discharge. On the other hand, if we're having very high discharges, so you can see the current, if it's very high, you might also be losing some of your potential capacity because we have the capital limitation where we are not able to provide fully uh, the, the sort of maximum capacity of the battery. Yeah, and there, there was a question actually about uh, mm. on of, like charts for the battery and software, but I guess that you have you have like quite extensive mm -hmm. modeling on 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 all, all the chemistry yeah, yeah. And, and such. Exactly. As soon as as you sort of feel comfortable, and this is something also that that they can be played around with little in the in the material that is available for the cells, uh, yeah. and get some of the more raw data because in the end you need to know all these parameters to self discharge uh, how it will react to temperatures to currents so, uh, and this is something of course that that we have yeah um, and another question sorry for uh, being uh, uh, no 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 go with yeah, the, um, the... Um, like uh, one one uh, question which i think is very interesting is like one which are the most important design considerations obviously there could be many, but this specifically about uh, uh, recycling. So how, how important is the recycling part of the design considerations? And I guess we, I mean, by that recycling in like, well, it, it needs to be able to be recycled in the end, I guess, the, the product. Definitely. And I would say, again, this, this sort of comes very, very much back to being a, a European manufacturer of batteries. We, of course, have a responsibility of, of, of gathering and then recycling what we are manufacturing. And I would say today, when we are seeing there's a very high push for, for raw materials, recycling is something that, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense from a lot of different perspectives. It makes a sense from an environmental perspective, but it also makes sense from the fact that we are seeing a higher and higher push towards raw materials. So. Whenever we have the possibility of reusing some materials, it is of course a very good opportunity. Yeah, and another question about the separator, like what what are the like? Say that you have a properly uh, manufactured battery by all mm. all means, uh, all standards. So mm. what what are is it temperature or what, what, or uh, external damage or what what is going to make a battery likely to fail? uh if if we are talking I, I think and then this i'm i'm not sure if i have the exact statistics on the most likely reason why we are seeing separator failures uh we have had some areas i think uh, and uh, maybe i should not uh, uh, mention the company name here but there was a company that sort of manufactured a cell phone that had a tendency to to start burning with the battery and this typically comes from pushing the separator to being too thin because of course if we're looking at the size of the battery we don't want to, to spend a lot of important size on a separator that doesn't bring yeah. us amp hours uh, but you don't want to make it too thin either because then you risk um, uh, puncturing it or you risk having the short circuit through the separator yeah, uh, I, I think I remember the, the, that time when there were certain phones that you couldn't bring yeah. on on airplanes. So, <laughs> <laughs> for yeah, sure. uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, no, and for sure, if, if we're talking um, secondary cells and if we're talking uh, uh, electrical vehicles, uh, then of course the mechanical considerations becomes important. Uh, when, whenever you are having a, a a car or something, you of course. You have a risk of having very mechanical damage to your cells that that could set off a sort of chain reaction. Good, good, good. Any more questions? Otherwise, I think if if just quickly because we we spoke a little bit about discharge rate temperatures. I promised to talk a little bit about just because it it does impact a lot. And then we are in Sweden now, so it, it can be quite cold. And you will see you do lose a lot of of. Uh, you do lose a lot of capacity on, on the, the temperature. Cutoff voltage, also important to consider that I spoke a little bit about before. If you're having a very yeah. flat curve, doesn't really matter. 
because you see it's basically the same. If you're not having a flat curve, your cutoff voltage will very much impact how much you can get out from your battery. So yeah. think on this and choosing the DC DC. Um, just before uh, before we go through deep, ah yes, and here you can see also how a pulse can very temporarily impact also the voltage. So this is something that's of course is also also something to consider. And you can see the pulse might actually be varying. Uh, but I think I'm, and the self discharge as a final one, uh, which you can see we can get these graphs. And this is, of course, some fundamental parameters of the cells that you can get. Uh, and this, of course, will also impact uh, the impact, yeah. the final life that you might be getting, because the self discharge will, of course, be eating up some of your capacity in the battery throughout the life. So if you're looking at having a sensor that should last 15 years, you know, re really make sure that you don't have a, a safety charge that is too high, because then you, even though you theoretically have your your amper hours ready, uh, they might not be there uh, after after 15 years because they might have already been eaten up by the safety charge. Um, what I, I, I got a question, an interesting question. Also, yeah. I actually have it written down since before uh, in my own notes as well, but the energy density. So I can, yeah. I can start with my question and then I fill on with, with a similar question. But mm -hmm. there, like the evolvement of energy density in batteries. Yeah. Like uh, I've heard numbers that it's like a slow, uh, but it's constantly evolving. Like, yeah. and uh, not much happens every year, but a little bit happens every year yeah. as far as I understand. So yeah. what? how much do you think about uh, how important is energy density in in batteries for IoT? Depends on the application. Yeah. Uh, say. Uh, for some of you, it will be very important. Uh, for others, it, it might not be. Uh, I would say we are not seeing, if, if we compare electrical vehicles, we are not seeing the same push towards uh, uh, optimizing these parameters. Uh, so, uh, so extreme as, as it is for, for electrical vehicles. But for sure, um, the smaller the better, the, the cheaper the better. It's, uh, it's, this, these parameters are, of course, important to consider. Yeah. And then and, and in, um, like, it is actually a, a specific question about uh, coin cell technology and what, what, what is happening in, in, in that specific area of battery technology. So. So I, I don't think I'm the best person to answer this uh, stuff. This is not very much involved in this type of coin sales uh, products. So, so I'm, I'm going to take a pass on that question. OK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it generally, like we, we could say that like the energy density, when we speak about that, it's when we speak about electric cars and batteries, that is, well, it's really important. You need to push <clears throat> as much battery you want to go as well as yeah. long as possible and as cheap as possible for the manufacturing when you but then we're pro talking about lots of power and lots mm. of energy and in an IT solution that is not as important like not I what say it, it has if we're talking IoT it's it's a lot self discharge is important cost yeah. is important typically you want your IoT device to be uh, quite inexpensive um, size in my experience, most of the time, size is, is a solvable issue. I mean, uh, it's uh, uh, as long as it's not wearable, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's typically you can solve this issue. But yeah. for wearable devices, for sure, it becomes more of a concern. Yeah. You, you mentioned earlier that you like we have the primary cells and secondary cells, and that, uh, well, we have talked a lot about primary cells, and the secondary cells are interesting, like for like solar systems that they mm. have small devices that are also powered with solar. What what's what's the evolution? What what is generally happening within the like? Are we seeing more and more self-powered devices, or or is the battery I, technology good enough for primary cell <laughs> applications? I think, I, I think uh, and uh, and maybe uh, yeah. maybe this is also some. Uh, there's for sure more to, to be learned on this, uh, but but I, I think I've seen some uh, some ideas or some early designs of, of sort of self-powered uh, IoT devices uh, that I have. I think there was some 
the sign of, of some uh, products being recharged by by the Wi-Fi network actually that they were so low power that they could be recharged by the, um, the frequencies from the, the Wi-Fi network. Uh, not sort of don't I don't have any more information about this, but but at least it's, it's a sort of interesting concept uh, and yeah. one that I definitely think is, is quite important to follow. I've seen similar other designs where it's just been um, been powered by vibrations. So if you're in a vibrating environment, uh, could also be used to sort of recharge your batteries. Uh, and then of course, solar is, is I think the most sort of a go-to solution today, but uh, there are some more exotic uh, exotic ideas being experimented with. So, and of course, from a battery perspective, we need to keep up with all of that. We need to make sure that, that we don't have a self discharge that is too high. We need to make sure that the size is, is reasonable and then everything relating to that. Yeah. Mm. So I think uh, just uh, before yeah, I'm sure you have a lot of more questions. I, I just think I'm going to show this type of tool uh, that sort of helps to to a bit uh, to help reschedule and get some of, of what I've said because in the end, of course, it's very hard to keep all of the it's very hard to keep all of the ideas in your head. Uh, but this type of tools, and I'm sure other manufacturers have a similar tool. Uh, will sort of help you to to pick or it, it will help you to at least recommend a battery and then of course you have to look further into it but let's say let's say we are designing something for smart building application and what we are doing is we are doing air quality monitoring and of course then uh, let's say we are let's say yes yes let's say we are indoor yes we are indoor we are in europe and our communication will be over narrowband. And we will send our measurements, uh, no, let's say once per day, it's enough. So by doing this, you can sort of uh, try to uh, model how your application will look. Let's say that we want a lifetime of 10 years. We are a bit ambitious here. And it will, based on this, uh, it will sort of see, okay, this, because we know that most likely your uh, your communication modem will be what is driving your, your current consumption. Uh, so we will sort of guess how your current profiles might look and we'll see, okay, what type of, of cell are we recommending for this? Now I show a very long time. So you can see that we are having a recommendation of a, one of these two cells uh, have, this is the cutoff voltage we think we should use. And uh, of course, this is something you could play around with. I mean, what, what would happen if, if instead of once per day, we are actually sending it uh, twice per day, you know, would, would we see, okay, then, then it comes sort of a much larger cell here. Uh, so it's, a, it's at least a tool that I think can help you uh, get a feeling about which cell might be right for you. Uh, and then of course, it might consider the more, you might, you might have to consider more parameters as well, but at least it gives the first flavor. Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, this will be really handy, but uh, let's say that you get a recommendation here for uh, a, a specific kind of battery. Are you able to find these on on, uh, on any place, Alpha or? Yeah, most of these I think are fairly available. Uh, then of course, I think uh, if, you, uh, if you choose here, I think if you actually download the report here, you are you will be sort of in contact with uh, with our sales staff or something like that yeah. if you want to uh, and uh, so it, it should be uh, it should be fairly available uh, if it's alpha or digiki or whichever supplier you're using but, but like generally i would say i i, I think that uh, when you're developing your like your your own project you, you like tinkering around and uh, then I guess that it would be a good recommendation start with a rechargeable battery, I guess, lithium ion battery, or should, is there any reason yeah. that you should start with a primary cell and, and uh... no, 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 I, I don't say mm -hmm. not during the development, uh, I would not recommend it. If you have the opportunity, depending on the sort of uh, your, um, your current generator, if you have a Typically, most of the new lab equipment that you have as, as a sort of power source will be also very helpful in terms of measuring the, the, the current drawn from the system. So you might be able to get these types of curves very accurately. 
with with even modern lab equipment. So this, I would say, it's, it's also very helpful to, to to understand your own system and in the end tissues of battery. But no, I don't, I don't see a reason to start with the uh, with the primary cell storing development. This you would typically have when you are scaling. Let's say you we are doing this indoor air quality monitoring IoT device, and we want to scale it. We want it in a, in every room in in, in every um, hotel across Sweden. You know that. Then of course it needs to be scalable, and that's that's when you are you're starting to implement this. This batteries. I actually got the question: uh, where where do I order these batteries? Is one one person asking, but uh, yeah. yeah, as I, you I, said, I, they, yeah, I think it should be fairly available in the normal uh, normal if it's Alpha DQ or TME or whatever they are called. Uh, yeah, should be uh, should be. Let's see if I can. Can I choose? Uh, can I actually just do a quick? I'm not buying here. Yeah, it should be. Oh, now I'm. Yeah, yeah. Digi DME Alpha should should have it for sure. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so uh, yeah, we we've learned a little bit about different. Uh, yeah, battery chemistries now and uh, primary cells for IoT. And um, well, it's been really, really interesting. And as you said, super easy. Or <laughs> <laughs> as it's, it's easy until you start with the details. <laughs> yeah, if, if, yeah, everything is easy uh, if you don't understand what 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 it's about. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh. Uh, but uh, I think that this has been really, really helpful to get an insight into to, into what actually is sort of driving the IoT revolution. Because mm -hmm. what we see now is that well, we have all these uh, well, very inexpensive sensors. So, like, uh, especially we see a lot of LoRaWAN sensors coming out now. Then, often we see battery times like ten plus years, uh, mm -hmm. which is well. I, if I think that like 10 years ago, we didn't see much of those kind of products, at least not for like a cheap option. No, no, for sure, for sure. No. So, so that is really, I, I would say that's, that's really uh, interesting that like we, we, it's a part of what is driving a lot of these IoT stuff. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's uh, it's if we're looking at in general on the battery world today, it's a very very exciting time to be in the in the world of battery development right now. It's it's a lot of yeah. things happening and it's a lot of interest from from many different use cases. Uh, electrical vehicles tend to take take a lot of sort of sort of uh, it tends to take a lot of place in the in the normal uh, discussion and debate. But but we need to remember that based on this, we're also having. Uh, maybe one of the largest expansion of the, the power grid today that we've had in a very long time. We are seeing more and more renewables that need to somehow be uh, be sort of covered and backed up by batteries. So uh, it's it's a very fun time for batteries right now, and it's, yeah. it's a lot of improvements being made. And, uh, and hopefully we, we will see some maybe some more exotic solid states or something coming to the market pretty soon as well. So we are yeah. we are we are seeing this as a very positive note as well. Yeah, and when we talk about uh, like en environmental factors, and you talked about raw materials and such, uh, that is one thing that is discussed uh, well all the time in the media, and especially well focused on electric cars. But like IT sector is not mentioned at all. Uh, I would say <laughs> at least not in the popular media. But but the thing is that like it, how does these different battery chemistries like what differences are there in like is it any chemistry that is like more un like environmentally friendly or um, or worse it, it's um, i would say it's uh, it's a bit hard to to say because there are so there are several perspectives you need to take here we know certain raw materials can be uh, they they can be both very sustainably produced and they can be both very unsustainably produced we have some raw materials that are limited to only certain parts of the world if we take nickel, we know nickel is, is, a, is a metal used a lot for the battery industry. And today we are seeing that, of course, Russia uh, was a big supplier of nickel, which, which might be a bit unethical to, to consume today. Yeah. Uh, if we compare it to, and there's still there are many other nickel suppliers that might be more ethical to choose from. If we're seeing cobalt, for instance, is another 
another sort of raw material that's discussed a lot where we're knowing that the manufacturers and the, the actual mining of cobalt is limited to, to quite a few places, uh, so not so many, uh, which is not maybe the, the, the most, uh, uh, most ethical places to be. And then we need to consider everything from the, the carbon dioxide manufacturing. We, we have a bit of a luxury in Sweden uh, with, with our power grid, grid being mainly based on renewables and low carbon emission electricity. Yeah. If we compare it to, for instance, China or, or other uh, big uh, battery manufacturing countries, uh, we're seeing China, seeing India, uh, you, you might see that the production process is, is very unsustainable. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, recycling, especially yeah. I mean, in terms of IoT, the, the, the volume, the, the kilograms of generated waste this is still quite limited. But the more sensors we put up, the more waste we will, will generate, which means it needs to be recycled. Uh, if we compare, we know each car will have a lot of, of batteries and a lot of waste when it reaches the end of life. But it's at least gathered in one place. If you're having a lot of IoT sensors that are very spread out, for a very small amount of, of metals, uh, it might be very difficult and very uneconomical to, to gather back again. So this definitely needs to be planned and then needs to be considered. Mm. Mm. Yes, I, I think that will um, end the discussion because we are one hour in to, um, into this session mm. and there are more to come for, for, um, for the course this evening, actually. So... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I thank you very much, Daniel. Um, if there are any uh, more questions, I might forward them uh, via email. And uh, yes, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Yes, thank you.